I'm David Wood. I'm with Pastor Daniel Scott, uh, who lives in Australia. And he, you're not really from Australia, are you? No, I'm not from Australia. Where are you originally from? I'm originally from Pakistan, which is a Islamic nation. Majority of the people are Muslim in Pakistan, so I was brought up there. But there is a, a, a large Christian major, uh, minority there, right? That's right. There's a significant number of Christians there. Uh, generally, Christians uh, are uh, not seen in uh, like high positions. Mm -hmm. That's sort of forbidden for Christians to yeah, go ahead in many walks of life. So, what was it like for you to be a Christian in Pakistan? Actually, in Pakistan, if uh, you are active in faith and you believe that Lord Jesus Christ is the only Savior, and you share your belief with people, then you generally uh, face uh, difficulty and problem, persecution, which is uh, part and parcel there. How did this work out for you in particular? Uh, because I was uh, quite uh, bold in sharing my faith and I've studied uh, Bible and Quran fairly thoroughly. So my colleagues, uh, I, they will ask me questions about religion and I will answer them adequately and they will invite me to become Muslim and I will explain them why I don't become Muslim. And uh, sometime I was uh, beaten when I was a student. Uh, first time my class fellow tried to kill me when I was in grade 12 at uh, Islamia College Guru Mandir in Karachi. Uh, so that was uh, difficult. Well, why did you leave Pakistan? Actually, in 1986, government of Pakistan introduced blasphemy law. Uh, that blasphemy law 295C carries death sentence that time it was death sentence or life imprisonment. But later governments changed it to only death sentence. However, I was the first one charged under that law. And the reason was my colleagues, they compelled me to convert to Islam. And uh, I explained to them from Quran and Hadith that uh, even in Quran, there's no hope of salvation for Muhammad. So I quoted them from Surah 46 verse 9, where Allah is, uh, uh, directing Muhammad to tell people that Muhammad did not know what will happen to him and Muhammad did not know what will happen to anybody else. So my colleagues got upset and uh, I quoted from Hadith as well, like say Muslim Volume 1, Hadith number 398 to 402 where Muhammad invited his relatives and he told them basically that he cannot save them from hellfire. And uh, so he told his daughter that my beloved daughter Fatima, you can have my worldly possession, but after this life, I cannot save you from fire. That means hellfire. So I explained them that, look, your prophet did not know what will happen to him. He did not know what will happen to anybody else. And uh, how do you think he can save me? Because uh, one of my colleagues said that if you become Muslim, Muhammad will save you. And I, I established from Quran Hadith. There are many other references, like in Hadith Bukhari. Muhammad used to pray more than 70 times every day of his life for the forgiveness of his sin, and still he had no assurance of salvation. So there are many hadiths on that. And so know. you were just quoting their own sources to them, telling them about their own religion, and they wanted to charge you with blasphemy for telling them about their own religion? That's right. Actually, in Islam, if you are telling truth about Islam, uh, that can be considered blasphemous. However, I did invite them that they should, need, they should consider Jesus, because Jesus is the only Savior, and I read... Uh, John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. So I said that you need to consider Jesus. So what happened after that, they arranged to file a case against me, and next day, they basically instigated all the students to boycott the classes. So more than 5,000 students in degree called Jokada. Uh, that's a town near Lahore, about 101 um, miles and uh, more than 500, more than 5,000 student, students, many with pistols and daggers, uh, they came on road. They were searching for me because in Islam, if you kill somebody for sake of Allah or if you die for sake of Allah, Allah promises to forgive your sins and admit you into paradise. So that was a big uh, uh, thing there which happened. And uh, finally, I left Pakistan and I uh, went to Australia. And how did Australia compare with 
your life in Pakistan? Australia is a pretty wonderful nation, and I thank God for that. Uh, like uh, there was uh, uh, no case filed against me in Australia since uh, uh, year 2002. Uh, so before that, uh, I used to share gospel with Muslim. I was teaching mathematics at the University of Queensland, but as usual, I used I share gospel with people when they ask question of faith. I, I thank God I boldly proclaim gospel. And sometime, like once one Muslim fellow, he threatened to kill me and uh, he was removed from the University of Queensland. So I never saw him after that. So in Pakistan, it was okay to threaten you or to try to kill you, but in Australia, when it happened, they stopped it. They stopped it. Yeah. However, in uh, uh, 2001, after September 11, uh, Victorian government passed a Tolerance Act. Under Tolerance Act, you are not supposed to offend anybody, and if you offend somebody, then you are criminal in a way. So I conducted a seminar. I was invited to teach in Melbourne, and the Muslims sent three white Australians who had become Muslim to spy the seminar. So they spied the seminar, and they filed a case against me. Before the court case, there was a conciliation meeting where I was asked that I should apologize to Muslim and uh, I should promise that I will never teach it again. And I said, I'm, I, I, I'm happy to apologize. Please tell me where I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, I will apologize. So they cannot say, could not say that what I'm teaching is wrong because that's teaching in Quran and Hadith. So I said, uh, so you're asking me that I should apologize for telling truth. I said, that's not fair demand. That's intellectual terrorism and you should stop, not me. So they didn't stop where they took me to court and uh, initially I and the other pastor invited me to teach. We were found guilty of vilifying Muslim people. And uh, Judge Michael Higgin, he actually made uh, many, many blunders in the uh, judgment and many false uh, accusations against me especially. I think there were total 213 errors in the, in the judgment. So he ordered me to apologize and I refused to do so. The interesting thing was, even in the courtroom, uh, the barristers and QC Queen's Council, that's very top class uh, uh, attorneys which Muslim employed, all three of them, they cross-examined me for six days and every one of them said, Pastor Scott, don't read from Quran and Hadith, you may be vilifying Muslims. And I raised the question to the judge that, Your Honor, if reading of Quran and Hadith it's vilifying Muslim people. Why these books are here? I mean, we don't need books around which are vilifying Muslim people. So Muslims feel vilified if you're reading certain parts of Quran and Hadith. Because actually, the reason they want to hide it because they want to convert people to Islam. And they also know that the teaching of their books is not good. If people will find out beforehand, they will not convert to Islam. And that's why they took me to court. And the court case lasts for five years and seven months. But thank God in Supreme Court there were three judges and they found that the judge of the tribunal was wrong so they cancelled the judgment and also ordered Muslim to pay us half of the court case cost for the Supreme Court. So the, the Supreme Court overturned it but you were initially found guilty? Yeah, initially I was found guilty because judge, uh, I don't know whether Muslim bribed the judge or they might have intimidated him, I don't know what was the reason but judge was like acting like a primary school student, made so many mistakes and uh, that's not, I think, common in the Australian justice system. So, so let, let me see if I get this straight. You're in Pakistan. You tell Muslims about what's in the Muslim sources, and they bring you up on charges of blasphemy, and they want to kill you under the law. You leave that country to come to the West, where you'll actually have freedom of religion and freedom to discuss ideas. You go to Australia, where you're supposed to have that right, and then you end up in court over talking about the same thing that you got in trouble for in Pakistan. That's right, yeah. So basically, Muslims are persecuting Christians in Islamic country by terror, and they're persecuting Christians in Western world through tolerance, acts like hate so, crime, tolerance so, acts. So in, so in the Muslim world, hey, you spoke, you spoke about Muhammad, you spoke about uh, the Quran, even if it's true, we count it as blasphemy and we'll kill you, but here in the West, they can't come out right out and kill 
you over blasphemy charges. So instead, instead they say, this person is promoting hatred and intolerance and he needs to be brought up on charges for that. So whether you're there or whether you're here, you're just not supposed to talk about what's in the Muslim sources. That's right. Yeah. That's uh, very sad. And the sad thing is uh, the uh, leftist people, what we call humanists, uh, secular humanists, they are being actually used by Muslim, fooled rather by Muslim, to promote Islam by uh, telling it's a wonderful religion and shutting up people uh, to tell the truth about Islam. And uh, that's the, the saddest thing. And even I, I know academics like in Islam, Allah says in Quran, as you know in Surah, I was speaking in Parliament House in, in Camera and Old Parliament House. There were three-day conference, some meetings were in the new Parliament House. And there, in three-day conference, I was um, on a panel, and my co-panelist is a uh, lecturer at university in Australia. And uh, somebody asked me a question, what is one big difference in teaching of Islam and Christianity? I said there are thousands of differences, but one big difference is Christianity is based on truth. So I've been Christian, I have to be truthful, not sometime, not most of the time, but all the time I have to be truthful. I said, whereas in Islam there's a teaching called takya, that means, al takya means the legal right of Muslims to deceive non-Muslim people. So my co-panelist, he showed up, he said, um, only Shia Muslim, they use takya, we don't use takya. And I said, Dr. Uh, 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 his name then, that, uh, look, I don't know you personally, it's possible that you don't use takya, but Allah teaches takya in Quran. Whether you're obeying Allah or you're disobeying Allah, I don't know. I said, you are from Middle East, you know Arabic, Arabic is your mother tongue. Allah says in Quran, Surah 3, verse 28, Surah 3, verse 28 says, Muslims should not befriend non-Muslim people, otherwise they will cut themselves off from Allah, but for security they can become a friend. I said, you know the Arabic word, there is takia, that means to deceive them, to trick them, to become a friend. So he sat down. So this is like we're dealing with, uh, even the academic are not honest, and uh, because uh, Allah teaches them to deceive and to, to lie and to those things, like Allah says in Quran, Surah 16, verse 101, uh, that uh, if Muslim is in uh, difficult, sorry, Surah 16, verse 106, some, verse, uh, some translation is Surah 16, verse 101, uh, 105, it says, that if Muslims are in a difficult situation, they can even say, I'm not a Muslim. That's in Quran. They should have firm belief in their heart, but they can say, I'm not a Muslim. Then Allah says in Quran, Surah 66, verse uh, 1 and 2, uh, it's uh, talking about oaths, and Allah says that Muslims are not bound by their oaths. That means Muslims can take oath to please somebody, to win somebody's uh, confidence, but then Allah says he has set them free from all their oaths. So it's really very tricky. So, so people who are leading uh, scholar of Islam, if they're Muslim, they, they know that practicing takya deception is all right because Allah uh, encourages to do that. So, and uh, Western scholar who don't understand Islam, they of course will tell what Muslim scholars are telling them. And those Christians who know Islam, and they, some, many of them have don't courage to tell truth because of intimidation and litigations. Well, you've experienced life in the Muslim world and you've experienced life uh, in the West, in Australia, and we are here in America discussing these things freely. Uh, do you have any thoughts for Western viewers who aren't sure uh, what position they should take on uh, Sharia and the spread of Islam? Sharia is the most inhuman law ever invented. So I will uh, encourage everybody to stand up against it. It is not good for anything and for anybody except for Muslims to control the population, uh, populace and uh, to rule them under iron fist. And uh, so uh, the way, of course, Muslim push it is what we call it, uh, pushing the thin edge of the wedge. So they, oh, it's just about prayers, just about family matters. But uh, even under family matter, many Muslims believe there, will, there should be women circumcision. So that, that will be then legal. Uh, Allah says in Quran Surah, now, there's no Quranic reference for women's circumcision. However, there are hadiths on that subject. Uh, Allah says in Quran Surah 4, verse 34, that Muslim can beat his wife uh, to bring her submission if she is disobedient. And uh, then, as we read in that Surah 4, verse 34, Surah 65, verse 4 says that Muslim can have a child wife if you especially read the Noble Quran translation 
translation by Tajuddin Halali and Mohsen Khan, uh, sorry, Takyuddin Halali and Mohsen Khan, it say that Muslim should wait for divorce in case of uh, older women for three, day, three months and for those women who are not ready to the mayor's age of menstruation, they have to vote for divorce for three months. So that's like a, that child marriage then becomes legal and then Muslim can have up to four wives as we read in Surah 4 verse 3. However it does it, they should all treat all equal. Uh, later on Allah amended his mind and uh, changed his mind and told in Surah 4 verse 129, uh, don't worry about treating all your wives equal, but don't neglect one of them altogether. That's Surah 4 verse 129. Then we also read uh, in uh, Surah 70 uh, verse uh, 29 to 31 that Muslim can have unlimited number of concubines and then we read in Quran Surah 24 uh, verse 33 that those women who are under right and control of a Muslim man he has right of sex with her so so on so we read the Surah 4 verse 24 and so on there so that becomes just a family matter it goes further than that if uh, one member of the family accepts uh, other religion or denounces Islam, then it becomes duty of a, a Muslim to kill that family member. And uh, that's still a family member. So it can go on and on and on. So uh, because that's not my main uh, topic to talk about, but it's a very, very cruel law. And uh, because in Islam, there's no concept of equality. That's totally missing. Uh, Allah didn't know what equality is. And so he didn't teach in, in the Quran. So like uh, even within Muslim, Muslim man is superior than woman, then uh, uh, non-Muslim are like Allah says in the Quran, Surah 98 verse 6, that people of the book, Alul Kathab, are bar shar al bariya that means the most wicked, the most evil of all creature, animals. That's in Quran, okay? That's the literal translation. And uh, then it says they will remain in hell forever and so on. So it's not really good at all. We read in Surah 9 verse 29 where Allah orders Muslim, commands Muslim to fight with people of the book, that means Jews and Christians, and uh, charge protection money from them, jazia, that means protection money, and not only that, humiliate them. So it's really no good for anybody. And uh, if we allow Sharia, that means we are taking the society back to 7th century Arabia. That's a very pretty dark age. Uh, like uh, Muhammad, according to Islamic belief, he, he did everything by inspiration. We read it in Quran, Surah 53, verse uh, 1 to 5, that he did not speak of carnal mind and he didn't do anything by carn carnality, but he did everything by inspiration. Now when we read Hadith, there are dozens and dozens of Hadith where we, we find out how the Prophet of Allah used to kill people, order to kill people. In some cases, it says in Hadith, dozens of these says that he used to order people to cut people's hands off, cut off their legs, and go to their eyes with red hot iron, and then throw them on hot pebbles. So that was his inspired way of killing. So if we were bringing Sharia in, that means uh, that should be then legal because Allah, Allah's Prophet did everything by inspiration, and he is the model for all Muslims to be followed. And. Uh just to sum up here, I, I find it really amazing that when you say, or I say, that people in the West, people in Australia and Great Britain and the United States, need to be on guard against Sharia, we need to make sure that Sharia is never implemented in our country. People call us uh, Islamophobes and bigots and hate mongers, and yet you were brought up on charges and found guilty of a crime in Australia for saying the same sorts of things you, you're saying to the camera right now. I was thrown in jail in Dearborn, Michigan in the United States of America for being with my friend Nabil as he answered the questions of Muslims who asked him the questions, who came up to him and asked him the questions. So here you have people going to court being charged in the United States for constitutionally protected activities and when we say we need to be careful what happens we're called hate mongers and bigots. Very strange situation, but I hope people uh, are starting to catch on. Thank you, Pastor yeah. Scott. Thank you very much for having me here. And I believe people will wake up, otherwise they will lose everything. You, you don't, by compromising with Islam, you don't gain anything. It's like what we say, appeasement. 
And the best uh, definition I've read of appeasement is, appeaser are the people who are feeding the crocodile, hoping that they will be the last to be eaten by the crocodile. So please don't appease Islam, don't appease, love Muslim people, care for them because Jesus died for them, and we have duty to love and to care for them. But don't accept their religion. It's no good for anybody. God bless you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.